All right. So we are going to Esther. <clears throat> We're going to start in chapter 2 in verse 19. And we are going to go through the end of chapter 3. So if you are able to stand, please stand for the reading of the word. I know you just sat down. Trust me, you guys will have plenty of time to get comfortable. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Uh, Esther 2, starting in verse 19, says, Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai, just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai, when the affair was investigated and found out to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. <clears throat> Chapter 3. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were, with, who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, so they had made known to him the people of Mordecai. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast her, that is, they cast lots, before Haman, day after day. And they cast it in month after month, until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad, and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep, keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasures, treasuries. <clears throat> so the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps, and to the governors over all the provinces, and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus, and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. <sighs> Father, Lord, as we uh, dive into this, Lord, we pray for um, your wisdom, Lord, and uh, your message. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a big chunk, isn't it? It's a lot going on in this passage. There's an absolute lot going on. <coughs> But the way that this 
goes is it flows together very well. There, there's, we're, we're doing both of them because I think the reaction in the second part is because of what happened in the first part. And so in order to, to, to get that flow, we gotta look at the whole thing. We gotta look at the whole thing. <clears throat> and as we're walking through this, we're gonna see a common pattern as, as we've been walking through <laughs> Esther. Um, there's, there's one thread that really kind of rolls through Esther. Just like, just like in, um, in John, there's that thread of all this was so that you would believe that you would point signs. All these coming through Esther is God's providence. When God's not even mentioned in the book, but, but God's providence is seen all the way through this book. All the way through what's going on is God's providence. That he sees that he's sovereign in all things. That's important for us to understand is, is his sovereignty. That he's got everything under control, even in the worst of situations. And it's really, really easy for me to say that. It's a lot harder to walk in that. So let's, let's, let's get right into this. Man, we're, I'm not going to... Don't, don't need a huge introduction. Let's get right into this. At the beginning of this, we see Mordecai was chilling outside the gates of the king. Just, just chilling out there. <clears throat> he overhears a conversation of two of the guys that... And, and they, they had become uh, a little disgruntled with the king. And so they plot to assassinate him. You know, they, they just tired of it. I'm going to get rid of it. Well, <clears throat> what was he doing there? Well, he probably went there every day to check on Esther. You know what I mean? Because you have to remember, uh, what was it, two weeks ago we were in this? Two, three weeks ago? I, I don't even remember. Two weeks ago. We were in this, and, and uh, if you remember in chapter two, Mordecai raised Esther, who was actually his cousin, as his own daughter. So, so when she was ripped out of their home because she was uh, beautiful, fair to look at, this is what it, uh, what the, the Bible describes her as. When she was ripped out, he was continually checking on her to make sure she was okay, to make sure that she was going in this direction. So he's outside the king's gate, and then. So what, what's going on? He hears this plot to, de, to uh, destroy King Ahasuerus. Now, in his mind, he's probably thinking, yeah, that's not really a bad idea. Let's just go and do that. But being that Esther, who was raised as his own, that he raised as his own, was in there, that, that could be kind of shady for that. So he used this, and he went and told Esther, hey, check this out. These two guys are plotting uh, to kill uh, the king. And so we're in the middle of this, and... <clears throat> they decide, Esther tells the king um, in the name of Mordecai. She didn't cover up his name. She said, hey, Mordecai came to me and these two guys are plotting. So the officials come together. They investigate, find out it's true. And then what do they do? Hang them. It's injustice. <laughs> they, they ain't playing. They weren't going to play at all. It's not the way that this works. Normally, in this type of thing, and, and when you do something like that for a king in, in Persia, in one of these, these things, you are usually rewarded very greatly immediately. There's usually this huge thing. You know, you saved the king's life. You saved him from, from an assassination attempt. They're usually rewarded greatly and elevated to a position, and things are just set in stone, and their life changes because of this one thing. Well... This didn't happen. This didn't happen. Um, as she says at the end of verse 23, it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Oh, okay, cool. We wrote it down. It's done. Mordecai saves the king. Now, it's important that's written in there because uh, coming up in the, in the weeks coming up, we're going to see how it being written down reminds Ahasuerus later on of what he does and then it, it it just reverses the roles it flips the script on everybody everything in the kingdom is turned over because he had forgotten i don't know how you forget when somebody saves your life but he had forgotten that that mordecai saved his life and you know right before they were about to destroy him so there's that there's mordecai there's there, there's the first little scene and the next thing it, it comes up that introduces this guy haman 
It calls it an agagite. <clears throat> you guys remember King Agag. 1 Samuel 15. And we're, we're not going to go there. I'm going to kind of just give a brief overview. <clears throat> Samuel uh, was commissioned to tell Saul, the first king of Israel, to go destroy the Amalekites. Get rid of women, children, animals, everything. Just destroy the whole land. <clears throat> well, Samuel, or I'm mean, Saul, comes back and is like, hey, I did it. Well, <clears throat> Saul was like, what's that bleeding of sheep that I hear? What's going on? What's this thing? And, well, oh, I saw that they were good. Okay, that's not what you were told to do. You were told to destroy everything. You were told to destroy the entire nation. And, and <clears throat> see, if Saul would have done this, we probably would have been in a different little story in Esther. His, obedience, his disobedience kind of affected Israel for many years to come. So he saw that, that, that the sheep were good. He, say, he, he allowed some of the people to live because he said, oh, we could use this stuff. In that, he also spared the king's life. The king of the Amalekites' name was Agag. Well, um, Samuel decided that since Saul was disobedient, that Samuel was going to step in and take care of what Saul messed up. So he took King Agag and hacked him into little pieces and destroyed him. I know it's really pleasant, isn't it? <clears throat> Just a little disobedience and then, you know, all of a sudden Samuel's a butcher. It's great. <clears throat> but this this is the middle of a, a, a division and a hatred between the Amalekites and the Israelites that had gone back for years and years and years and years. There's always a hatred of the Jews. It always seems that no matter where you go, there always ends up to be a hatred for the Jews. I mean, even up to what, a little less than 100 years ago, there was a plot to destroy all the Jews in the world. Um, <clears throat> so one view of it is that he was a descendant. There's two different views of this, this term, Haman the Agagite, Agagite, whatever. There, there's two different views. One is that he's a direct descendant of this king, that he's an Amalekite. That, so, so there's that hatred. But there's another way to look at it that, that uh, people reading back, they would have only just known him as Haman. His name wouldn't have been the Agagite. But as a descriptor for people reading, they would have known right away that Agagite was a term used to uh, signify that someone hated Jews. He was an enemy of a Jew, of the Jews. And that was a term that, that they had used. So there's two different ways we can look at it. One is that he was of the bloodline, or two, that he was just a Jew hater, that he was anti-Semitic. So if you look at it in that way, in that, in that form, then we could have said that Adolf Hitler would have been Adolf the Agagite, if, if you look at it in that way. It, just to give it kind of a context, so, so to kind of understand a little bit, that's a little bit more recent history, and a lot of people know that name. <clears throat> But it introduces this character. And it says that he promotes him. The king promotes Haman. Above all the officials. Puts his throne above everybody to where he is basically the king's right hand man. <clears throat> well. That could have stirred up some stuff in Mordecai. Mordecai just saved the king's life. Blew the whistle on a plot. All, all this stuff. And it would have been right for Mordecai to be promoted up to that level. It, it just would have been right. And it was actually usually what happened in these situations. But then he was just kind of like, oh yeah, thanks, cool. Push the side. And then comes Haman. <clears throat> right hand man of the king. The new right hand man. Given all kinds of authority. All kinds of influence over the king. And remember, this was of 127 provinces. This is like the leader of the free world at that time. Or maybe not free world, but leader of the known world. <clears throat> and there's this thing in verse 2. <clears throat> and all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman 
for the king had commanded concerning him. There was a demanded respect for this guy. <coughs> that he was the right hand of the king, and the king demanded respect to be paid to this man. That, that people were to honor him. Basically, in the place of the king, that they were that, that, that it was demanded, and Haman was demanding this. He says, you need to bow down to me. That this is my position is this, and you must bow down. And this is this demanded respect never goes over very well, does it? When there's demanded respect, respect is one of those things, and, and paying homage to somebody is one of those things that is earned through relationship and earned through trial and earned through walking through something, and, and, and that respect and, and all that stuff is earned by a life together. Uh, when someone demands something, it usually throws, I know it throws me in, in some kind of way. Well, I'm this, I don't give a rip. I don't really care. It's not real. To demand these things is not real. And as everything unfolds, it's easy to see why Mordecai would say, dude, I'm not, I'm not bowing down to this guy. I don't, it, it doesn't really say why. People will, will imply that, that maybe it was because, because Mordecai was a Jew. Because he was standing up, you know, they'll, they'll line it up with like Daniel and Daniel's refusal to bow down to, to the golden statue and all that stuff every time the trumpet was blown. And it, they can relate that to that, but that doesn't really say that here. And a lot of scholars actually believe that that wasn't the case. I actually, reading it, I think that Mordecai was just upset. He was, he was angry because this guy's demanding respect when he was probably in the position that Mordecai might have felt that he was supposed to be in. So either way, Mordecai refused to bow down to this guy. Just absolutely refused. More, or Haman's not very happy with this. You know, people are checking up. Hey, so so this guy gets passed, right? You know, this guy's not bowing down. You guys must have some some kind of thing worked out. Everything's good. No, no. Oh, you're the Jew, right? You know, you know, you know this guy's a Jew too, right? Um, and he's not bowing down. It says that Haman's furious. It, it actually used those words, right? He was filled with fury. Yes. In verse 5 it says, Mordecai did not bow down. He was filled with fury. But he did not want to take matters in his own hand. He did not want to do it one-on-one. -on -one. He wanted to do this the legal way. He wanted to take this higher. So he sought to destroy all the Jews in the country. All the Jews under King Ahasuerus. He, did, he sought to destroy all this. So he starts this thing, this her. Um, basically, he's just casting lots, throwing dice. Hey, is it time? Is it time? Is it time? It's, it wasn't really a gambling thing. What this was was that they would cast lots or throw dice or flip coins. We, you know, we, we do similar things. But what, what they were doing is they were asking of the gods what they should be doing. They were. They, it was more of a divination kind of thing. They were just trying to seek out God or, or their gods and the wisdom that they would have in this thing. <clears throat> Haman manipulates the king and says, hey, check this out. Check this out. I'll give 10,000 talents of silver to the people that put this out and it can go in your treasuries. He's bribing the guy. He's bribing the king. He's bribing all this. This is this is what's going on. He's bribing him. And basically he buys the king to annihilate the Jews, to just get rid of them. After 11 months, uh, this is, you, you got to think, day in and day out. He's flipping the coin, rolling dice. Hey, is this the day? Nope, 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 nope. For 11 months, 11 months he's seeking to destroy. And and he hasn't even approached the king on this. But as, as that 11th month comes up, he, he approaches the king after it seemed that the gods have said yes. The king gives him his signet ring, which is basically his rubber stamp is saying anything that Haman put in place, all he had to do was stamp that signet ring, and it was let it be written, let it be done. It's done. Sealed. That, that's a pretty pretty powerful. The king of the, the the biggest territory in the known world, and this dude who's a snake, 
has the authority just to set stuff in motion. <clears throat> We're going to step back for just one second. In Esther 2.20, just remember this. It says, Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai commanded her. The king did not know that she was Jewish yet. That's important. That's going to play, that's going to play a role as the story starts to unfold <clears throat> later on down the road. Because right, right now, you know, all, all the king knows is, oh, my right-hand man wants to destroy the Jews. Let's destroy the Jews. Yeah, he's going to give me money. Let, let's do this. Let's do this. It'll work. So casting lots, 11 months, 11 months, 11 months, 11 months. Day in and day out, day in and day out. Casting lots, casting lots. And then finally, the 12th month, the lot falls on go. Everything is set in motion, and this decree is set in. Right? This decree is set in. Look at verse 13. That's where the decree is. It says, Letters were sent by cour couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So God's providence is weird. God is in control, we are not. God knows the things that are being unfolded, and we don't. Every law is cast, but the, every decision is in the hands of the Lord. And, and, and this is kind of one of those important things. This is one of those things that, that is really in there. <clears throat> because this decree goes out on the eve of Passover. For 11 months. <clears throat> For 11 months they are casting lots. For 11 months, they were casting lots and casting lots and nothing and nothing. And finally, on the eve of Passover, everything is set in motion. I don't think that that's a coincidence. I don't think that that happened just by chance. Because there's nothing that happens by coincidence or happens by chance. Because God is sovereign over all. And, and as, as, as you unfold this story, it's easier to see God's providence when you start at the end and, and start unfolding it backwards. And that's what John Flavel says, is that, that providence is seen like, is easiest read like a Jewish word to be read backwards. It's a whole lot easier to see what God's doing after it's already done. And then you can go back and say, okay, I see that, I see that, I see that, I see that. Ah, God, you started this a long time ago. So they were casting lots. And Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So they were seeking wisdom from the gods, but what they were really getting was God in control. The Lord, the Holy One of Israel, was the one that was actually setting the lot. Could you imagine? I mean, a lot of times we pray for stuff. And we pray for stuff and we pray for the same thing over and over and over. <clears throat> just, just say, for instance, that you're throwing dice, seeking wisdom. For 11 months, that's like 330 days. Every day is a no. It's 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 a no. I mean, I get tired after a couple weeks. I'd be like, yeah, th maybe this isn't one. Maybe this isn't more. Relentless. Day after day. How, what are the chances of not landing on the, on the yes? 330 no's, and all of a sudden there's a yes. <laughs> he probably was like, oh, it's time. It's time. We're doing this now. <clears throat> and then there's an irre irrevocable decree. These decrees, you can't, the king can't even just overchange them. So when he makes it, when he makes a decision, you know, you know we heard about getting rid of Queen Vashti in, in, in a drunken, uh, basically temper tantrum he gets rid of his wife and and then feels bad after he sobers up and is like dang it was too late he couldn't do anything about it these decrees are irrevocable they can't change anything they can't do anything about it but this is where being a jew in the middle of this irrevocable decree because you know they had to hear because these messengers went out to the land and like, okay, what is it, 13th month of, of, of Adar? 
kill, destroy, annihilate every Jew, woman and child, everybody. Just get rid of them all. <clears throat> From this perspective, we're like, okay, cool, yeah. But what if you were one of the ones to be destroyed? And you had your traditions, you had been reading, and you had grown up in your Jewish traditions, and, and you had heard that God is going to take care of His people. So a question that, that we would be asking, I would be asking is, is, okay, we're in a pagan land, is God still going to save us here? Is God's promise still good even in the pagan land? We didn't go back to Jerusalem with everybody else. We chose to stay. We built houses. We did this. We planted plant fields and we married and we did this and we chose to stay here. And now things are breaking loose. Now it looks like we're going to be destroyed. Is God still faithful in this? Will His promise still come true and come through in the midst of this? Or were the promises specific to us going back to Jerusalem? That would be something that I'd be asking myself. Okay, I know God is faithful. I know He promised, but you know, in the midst of the, the heat and in, in the midst of the trial, be like, Maybe I got something wrong. Maybe I missed something here. Maybe they, they could have been just pouring over Jeremiah again and saying, okay, because you're going to return us. You're going to, okay, it doesn't, doesn't say that the promises of God are no good. I, I, I don't see. And, and we could ask ourselves, why would God allow this decree to come in if he's such a good God? Why would he even allow the threat of this in there. His people are in danger and they don't really know what's going on. <clears throat> in verse 15 it says, The couriers went out hurriedly by the order of the king and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel and the king and Haman sat down to drink. They just issued this decree to annihilate an entire race. And what do they do? Let's go have a beer. Let's go chill out. Let's go see what happens. It says, but the city was thrown into confusion. The citizens of, 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 of this was just all a mess. Again, like John Slavel says, is providence is like a Hebrew word. It's only understood when read backwards. Looking back after knowing the whole story, after knowing you know, the reversals that keep happening and God coming through and all this stuff going on, it's easy to see the way that God was working. But when they're in the middle of this, it was probably really hard to see God's existence and God working. That's when the faith of all this stuff is in question. When the trial is coming and their life is on the line, they're like, is God real? Is this really what's going on? I know Torah says that God is going to be faithful to us. He's going to destroy the Amalekites. He's going to do all this stuff. But I don't see it right now. I do not see it right now. There's a lot of times that we're in those same situations. Providence is easier to see looking back. I remember the first day that I was upset free, 1999, way back in the day. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> and I remember the day I got saved, the first day that I was at Set Free. And I also remember it being placed on my heart that I was going to preach the Word. And I didn't have a clue what that meant. I didn't have a clue what that meant. And then seeing that all these trials and all these struggles that were going on, but it didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. I did not see how God was doing it. And then after I got kicked out of set free, and I was like, what the heck is going on? God, I thought that this is what you were doing. And going back and leaving and coming back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Some of you guys understand that. <clears throat> didn't always see what was going on. Coming to Florida. Didn't always see what was going on, but now I can look back and see how God was unfolding His plan in my life at that time. 
And sometimes, right now, you may not understand exactly what God is doing in you right now. But you got to trust. You got to trust that, that nothing happens by accident. You are not here because of this or because of that. You're here because God has brought you here. Amen. Every single one of you. Even the visitors are here visiting because God brought you here today. God is still working in the most unjust and stressful situations. Just because we don't know what's going on doesn't mean that God's not doing something. Just because it's not plain to us doesn't mean that God isn't at work. We have a tendency to think that just because things are not going our way that God is not real or that God is not at work. That's not it at all. Because here's the thing. God does what's best for you, not what you like. God knows the end from the beginning. And He works His plan out accordingly. It doesn't matter if it's comfortable. It doesn't matter if it's easy. It's actually better if it's not easy. Because if it's easy, then you'll run away again. Kind of remember... Think about this. If, if any of you guys were given a car when you when you turned 16, uh, you didn't really care much about that car. You rode that car to the ground, killed it. Let's see what it can do. Tie rods flying everywhere. <laughs> Rear end sitting in the thing. You're still doing donuts. You're like, ah, I don't know what that clanking is, but, but it sounds really cool. If I do it right, it's in rhythm. <laughs> didn't care too much about it. Hey, my, my grandparents gave me a car. I was like 18 years old. I ended up trading it in. Didn't really care much about it. But I'll tell you what, I hear something weird in my truck that I'm paying for. That sounds different. What's, what's going on? Nothing is outside of his hands. Your time here is not outside of his hands. Your time away from your family is not outside of His hands. The time of struggle that you're, you're, you're pressing in and not understanding what even the point of this is. God is in this. Every step of the way. In your disobedience, in your stupidity, God is still in it. But Pastor, I just want to know what's going on. Yeah, me too. I do. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's happening next. He hasn't given me that. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us. So the things that you know, hey, God's given you that. Things you don't know, it's not, you should. It's above your pay grade. God knows. We're just called to trust. We're called to trust that His promises are faithful. We're called to trust that He is faithful in His promises. That's why the word of, knowing the Word of God is so important because we rest in His promises and, and knowing the stories like Esther. It, it, because, you know, at the beginning you're like, whoa, this chick is going through some stuff. She gets ripped out, gets an audition in the bedroom of the king. She passes. But why? Her father figure is still hanging out trying to keep an eye on her and make sure that she's okay. Even though he's completely powerless to what's going on, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't care for her, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love her, it doesn't mean any of that. We don't understand why Vashti was removed in a drunken rage and Esther was placed in, who hid her things, deception and, and all kinds of immorality is unfolded through this whole thing. Mordecai saves this dude, saves the king, king blows him off and raises this other guy it doesn't even make any sense. And this guy plots to destroy a whole nation. The Jews in that town will not have a clue what's going on. They'd have been crying out, Lord, where are you? Lord, are you even real? Not understanding what's about to unfold. In the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the trial, we do not understand what's going on. <clears throat> but that's where we're called to trust in Him. We're called to trust in Him even if we don't understand. That's what faith is. 
I don't understand things a lot. I'm kind of a dumb person when it comes to understanding the things of God. It, it doesn't always make sense. And I'm like, but Lord, this, what? Things are going so good. But I want you guys to rest in the comfort. I'm going to read the second paragraph of the uh, chapter 5 of the London Baptist Confession. Because I want you guys to get some comfort knowing, excuse me, that God has this whole thing in His hand. It says, All things come to pass unchangeably and certainly in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God. I'm going to read that again. Sorry. All things come to pass unchangeably and certainly in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God. Who is the first cause? Thus, nothing happens to anyone by chance or outside of God's providence. I'm going to pause right there. If something happens outside of God's control, then God is not God. Amen. And He's not powerful enough to handle it. There's no power. There's no force. There's no human being. There's no system in this world that can distract from what God is doing or that God doesn't have His hand in. And you say, well, what about the evils in the world? God is still in control. <clears throat> Yet by the same providence, providence, God arranges all things to occur according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or in response to other causes. <clears throat> so as Esther unfolds and we see the salvation of the Jews is coming, I'm sorry, I'm giving away the end. The salvation of the Jews is coming. What's he use? He uses Haman. It wasn't his direct hand, but he uses secondary things. In our life, the things that God is doing, He uses secondary things. He uses uh, set free as a secondary cause in order for you to get to know Him. He uses your family in order to drive you to go to a place to get help. He uses people passing away in your life in order to speak to your heart. <clears throat> he uses leaders that you don't understand in order to to steer your heart and to do things that you don't even understand to teach you patience and to teach you to trust in God. He, he uses people all over the place. He uses your loved ones to comfort you or to confront you. He uses people as secondary causes in order to accomplish His plan. He uses our choices in order to accomplish His plan. That's God's sovereign. That's his sovereignty at work is that there's nothing under the hands of under in this world under the earth that has anything outside of God's sovereign plan. Your stupidity was factored in there. Thank God. Amen. Because if it wasn't, you know, when when Adam and Eve sinned, God wasn't like, Psh. what am I going to do now? No, that was all part of the plan. That was all meant to be. Why would God put the uh, the opportunity to sin because it was part of the plan. It was part of the plan. <clears throat> Why did you have to get strung out and go to prison? It was part of the plan. <clears throat> he used your choices as a secondary cause to get your attention. Why did everybody abandon you? It's part of the plan. Because God is still with you. And He, he wants you to know that He is still with you. There is no accident that you are where you are. There really isn't. There's no accident that I'm where I'm at. God has placed us where He wants us to be. He is in control of all these situations. It doesn't make you a puppet. It doesn't make you a robot. It doesn't make you not make real moral choices. It doesn't make you like remote control freaking dude or anything. It just, God is still in control. <coughs> he didn't put the pipe in your mouth. But He did use it to get you to where you are. So that He could teach you. And show you. And reveal Himself to you. You may not be able to see what God is doing right now. 
And some of you guys will leave before you see what God is doing right now. But that doesn't mean that God's not doing something even in your stupidity and leaving. Still, God is still working. I'm not telling you to leave. Somebody will, oh, he told me I could go. <laughs> he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8.28. He has not abandoned you. He is working right now in ways that you can't even see. Later on, you'll be able to look back and say, man, I know what you were doing. I know. I, now I see. I think Esther is really here to show us that in the most dire situations, in the most desperate of times, we can see God still working behind the scenes. And because he, we can trust that He is working, we can trust that He's got this. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what's going on, trust that God has got this. That He sent His Son to die for you. He, he satisfied your salvation. Sometimes we just got to trust Him in today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, help us. Lord, we really need to know you. Lord, we really need to be able to trust in your sovereign hands. <clears throat> Lord, we really need to be able to walk out in this life when we don't understand what's going on. Lord, you're not going to reveal all things to us at all, all times. Lord, it takes a, there's a process that goes on. Lord, I, I ask that you help us to trust the process that you have us on. Trust when we don't understand. Believe when things just seem to be gone and empty. But I pray that you continue to reveal yourself to, to people. Lord, even, even though our situations might not be ideal, Lord, we know that you're still at work. And that you'll show us when it's time, if it ever becomes time. Help us to trust you, Lord. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good night.